From Equity Mates Media, this is The Dive. I'm your host, Sasha Kelly. The football, or soccer, World Cup has kicked off in Qatar overnight. For the next two weeks, the world's attention will be trained on the football fields of Qatar as the world's best players compete for the ultimate national prize, winning a World Cup. But equal to the attention focused on the pitch is the climate around it. There's been a lot of media attention. There's been a lot of media commentary at Qatar's human rights record, at the migrant labor used to build these new football stadiums, and how they ultimately won the right to host the World Cup in the first place. In today's episode of The Dive, we speak to one of Australia's highest profile football commentators, Ed Cavalli, one third of the Sen- one third of the trio, Santo, Sam and Ed. But before then, I'm joined by my colleague here at Equity Mates. It's Alec Renahan, who's going to help set the context for this World Cup. Alec, welcome to The Dive. Hey, Sasha. Good to be here. Very good to have you because I've got to admit, I know about the World Cup happening, but I'm not a football fan myself. So let's start with the very basics. What is the World Cup? Yeah, so the World Cup is, I guess, the ultimate prize in national competitions. Mm -hmm. You might argue that winning a trophy for your club is bigger, but when you're representing your country, you want to win a World Cup. And if you want to be known as the greatest player of all time, as some of the players competing in this World Cup want to be known, they really need a World Cup on their CV. Yeah, they want that image of them holding what I imagine a giant trophy, standing there in front of thousands of adoring fans. Yeah, so it's big. Uh, The way it actually works, we've got 32 teams competing. There were World Cup qualifiers and the rest of the world have been knocked out. The 32 final teams left standing. For the next two weeks, we're going to watch them compete in eight groups. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to see them go to a knockout stage. Ultimately, we're going to have one winner. And the World Cup's held every four years. Okay, so there's lots of conversation about the fact that the World Cup is being held in Qatar. How did that decision come about? How do we decide where it's held? Yeah, so this is really where the controversy began, right at the very beginning when they were awarded the World Cup. And how a World Cup location is decided is by a vote by key FIFA members who ultimately have a complete discretion as a group on where a World Cup is held. Countries bid and they vote on the winner. Now, think of it like the Olympics. The International Olympic Committee decides where an Olympics is held in the same way FIFA decides where a World Cup is held. Except, unlike the International Olympic Committee, there's a lot more corruption. Well, a lot more alleged corruption when it comes to FIFA's process, but we'll let Ed explain all of that. (laughs) Okay, I'm looking forward to hearing a bit more about that. Last question before we kick off the interview. Why is this a business story? Because it just seems like an excuse to talk about sport. Yeah, it does feel like we're shoehorning a topic that we're interested in, doesn't it? Uh, No, there is a really interesting business story here. So for context, hosting a World Cup is expensive. In 2014, Brazil hosted the World Cup. They spent about 15 billion US dollars. In 2018, Russia hosted the World Cup. They spent about 14 billion US dollars. So that's sort of the ballpark to host a World Cup. In 2022, Qatar is estimated to spend 220 billion US dollars to host the World Cup. So more than 10 times, almost 15 times more than the previous two World Cup hosts. And that got us thinking here at the dive why? How can you justify such a big increase in spend? Is there a return on investment? Is this all about nation building or Mm -hmm. sports washing, which we will get into in this interview. But ultimately, we wanted to know why. And we turned to Ed Cavalli, who knows a lot more about football, to help us understand. And for context, when you're listening to this, this interview was recorded last Thursday, the 17th of November. I'm looking forward to it. Let's get into it. Ed Cavalli, thanks for joining me. Yeah, great to be here, bro. But um, listen, man, this 15 minute limit. It's just not gonna. It's just, we're just not gonna make that. We're just. <laughs> we're just. It's just not gonna happen. We need extra time. We need injury time. This. This is the biggest business slash sporting event in the world. It needs. It needs because there's a lot to. There's a. You sent me questions. Yeah. And oh man, we got. We got answers. We got answers. Okay. All right. Well, look. If you if you can give us answers, we'll give you extra time. That's that's the deal. <laughs> but look, let's let's start here, and um, we'll see where it goes. Uh, Qatar are reportedly spending two hundred and twenty billion US dollars on this World Cup. 
compared to 16 billion from Russia in 2018, 20 billion from Brazil in 2014. We want to start here. We are a business podcast and we couldn't really get our heads around the business rationale for a 10x increase in spending. So, so why spend the, so much? Well, uh, that's probably conservative as well. So that's probably a conservative estimate. Um, but so for them, it's about, and they've said this a number of times, it's about nation building. Um, we're going to probably get onto sports washing later. I am less concerned about that. So the key moment, one of the key moments is to go back to 2005 when they opened the Inspire Academy, which quote from their website, so I'm sure I'm being tracked, has the ambitious, tar- ambitious, ambitious target by 2020, two years ago, I need to update the website, to be recognized as the world's leading sports academy development of youth athletes. Opened in 2005, and guess who they had at the opening? It wasn't like, you know, two people from Love Island. They had Pele and Maradona. Those were the two people who opened this thing. So okay. the, the eyebrows that you're raising, those are the eyebrows that they want to keep raised up. Now, we're going to get to this and why it's important because who is the current – here's a quiz question. Who is the current global head of the Inspire Academy sports division? Because there's other divisions, but who is the well, sports head? Well, Ed, I, you're not the only one that's done their research. Yeah. And by research, I mean spoken to you beforehand. I believe it's Tim Cahill. <laughs> oh, isn't that – interesting so that plays a part to what we're going to get to when it's tinfoil hat time but there he is mr tim cahill and god bless him as he said himself a kid who left school at 16 from western sydney now running this multi-billion dollar sports inspire academy but also so that's partly why they're spending that money but another part of why they're spending that money as we know is it's all these gulf countries not wanting to have to rely on fossil fuels when the guardian finally cancels them And then secondly, they don't also, (laughs) but they also need quite literally other things to do, which they've said. They want this to be the place. So they've got like this, quote, global scouting network that they keep speaking about. So, you know, Tim Cahill will mention in interviews that uh, uh, that the, the Qatari javelin throwers have never been better. Well, who gives a shit? But the point is, it's just to be able to continuously bombard the world with press releases about progress and positivity coming out of Qatar and sports the easiest way to do it because it's the easiest thing to quantify. Yeah, and I think that that gets into this idea of sports washing. I guess um, we are hearing it in the the sense of like covering up their human rights atrocities potentially, but also yeah. I guess sports washing, as you said, can be used to as a proxy for progress and nation building. Uh, yes. So help us uh, get our heads around sports washing and is it worth $220 billion? Well, it depends who you ask because you can uh, – so this is not new at all and it's certainly not new for the World Cup. Mussolini did this in 1934 when he, he did not like football, uh, Mussolini, but he liked the idea that he could look good with football. So in 1934 for that World Cup, he printed tickets on the finest of paper the best paper you've ever seen in your life, so that people had something to go and say to the rest of the world, isn't, it, isn't Italy a great place? Are you sure about that? A bit, bit much known. And look at these tickets. I went to the <laughs> World Cup. And they also, they paid people to go. So they paid for fans to go to this World Cup. And what did we see yesterday? I don't know when we'll be listening to this, but three days before the World Cup, what did we just find out? That they had been caught, Qatar, using, we think, expats or foreign workers to paying them as being fake fans and for teams that were lining up. So they did Brazil, right? They did a video on TikTok on Brazil of all these Brazilian fans that had rocked up, you know, early. As it, okay, fine. And then they did one to say, okay, now look at all these English fans that have rocked up and are also having a parade. The problem that they had was they were, they were using the same instruments. So they were the same. <laughs> and the last time I checked, Brazilian fans and English fans weren't in an instrument exchange program. And the other, re- the other reason they got caught is no one's going to ever believe that there are other English fans. They, they, everyone hates England. That's why they got caught. They had to pick the one country that basically everyone in the world hates and wants to lose at the World Cup. So any other people, they could have picked Iran and people would have been like, yeah, okay, that kind of makes sense. But England, forget it. And they also were paying. So the Dutch have been really critical. Right, really, really critical, and they still are. The coach is like, "This is stupid. Why are we here?" But we'll get to that later. So, the, one of the first things Qatar did is they made an approach to Dutch influencers to go to Qatar and be paid and be paid to do positive posts about Qatar. 
So they go to who's criticizing them and they find a way to go, well, if they don't like this, this part of them do. So that sort of evens it out somehow. And the, the irony of that is, of course, you're flying influencers in to do stories about the World Cup, influencers who will then be arrested for taking a photo in a bikini in public and therefore undoing all of your good work. Yeah, it, it is confusing. And, and I, I guess it's also confusing because for every Dutch influencer that you fly over, the world's media is turning their attention on Qatar. And, you know, we, we're we speaking about it here on a, on a business podcast. Mm. If you didn't have the World Cup, the focus wouldn't be on uh, on all of the issues, but instead they're now got the world's attention on them and they're having to you know, pay these influencers. It feels it feels like they're not so much sports washing as sports spotlighting, and then and then you <laughs> and then you add to that the players themselves are revolting, and you know Denmark is wearing a protest kit. Australia's uh, players released a critical video. Has this backfired? Uh, look, it depends. Once again, it depends on who you are and who you're answering to. So, uh, so. One thing that we've got to make very, very clear at this point, and we will get to the, the results on the pitch in a moment, because that's where all these chickens are going to come home to roost. And I've got very strong conspiracy theories about these. <laughs> but the other thing that's happened is a Qatar's attitude has changed. They have finished apologising. So that has been a big, oh, you know, the World Cup's for everybody. It's this, it's that. And they're just now like, you know what? We paid for this and you can actually, excuse my language, you can fuck off. <laughs> because the other day, right? Oh, the World Cup's for everyone. The World Cup's for everyone. You know, okay. Well, it's for everyone except the following groups of people. And there was a uh, a bloke on a Qatari former national player on German TV the other day who forgot the script. He was on TV and he was asked about the LGBTQ you know, plus you know people who want to go and want to support it, and he just had it. And he called being gay a damage in the mind. And that was every now and again, the, it just drops a little. The little, mm. the, the the perfect sports watch, whatever you want to call it. And yes, and two days ago, the Danish, of course, the Danish were filming, and just blokes tried to stop them filming, no reason. And then they say, "You don't need a permit." He goes, "We've got one." It was like Ned Flanders, you know, when when Homer starts the lynch mob in Springfield, and it's no burning leaves without a permit. I got one too late, and by then his house is already on fire because they've kicked the leaves. It was that exact moment, and so they just now the rubber is hitting the road, and you can feel them actually now going, "Why have we been? Why are we apologising? What, what are we doing? We paid for this shit. We we got it through the you know the FIFA process, which I'd love to cover at some point. How they got this bid." And why that, and how that plays into where we are now, and how that's going to play out on the pitch. Because this is not some people. Oh, it's an outlier. It's a disgrace. You know, I've got a saying that I always like to use. How do you know something is not true? How? I saw it in a Netflix documentary. Right? They are over as they are over a million when it comes to facts in documentaries. Right? They're always opinion documentaries. They always have a Netflix always have a reason to suddenly come up with some documentary where they've made up half the quotes or it's all basically all mostly bullshit. So they've got a FIFA one that's come out today. And you're like, righto. So they've got this FIFA one where they say they go back through the bidding process. Now, this is true. When Qatar got the World Cup, uh, during that time, 22 of the 22 that voted, 16 of those Exico members in FIFA, because it's only 22 people who decide it, have either been banned, accused or indicted for criminal corruptions, involved in FBI cases, or accused of ethical violations but not conv- convicted. Two of them were already off the voting panel because they'd been done in a newspaper sting trying to sell their votes. So as recently as 2020, the FBI is still coming after them. These blokes are so corrupt that they could be the Premier of Victoria. It is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, this is what the traitors on Channel 10 thought it was going to be. Just film FIFA. You want to you want to have a show called Traitors? Just film the FIFA Exico. But <laughs> it's not a shock. It was the logical extension of a process that they had designed. So when the former FIFA president, the demonic Swiss gnome, Joseph F. Blatter, he's, now, he's trying to blame Michel Platini. And he's saying it's all Platini's fault. He was the head of UEFA Europe at the time. He switched. I wanted it to be for America. Nothing to do with me, says the bloke that ran it for 30 years and whatever. We can get to that's a, a topic for another day. 
But I've got a little grab which I want to play because the, the legend that is Tarek Panja, the journalist, uh, he was on Pod Save the World, which has done a good job recently. But follow T A R I Q P A N J A. And of course, put his name into search. The guy's a, a flat stick genius. And he literally is the only human being that willfully goes to all of FIFA's congresses as a journalist and sits there and listens to their bullshit. The man deserves a Nobel Prize just for that. So this is him talking about a dinner, a dinner that took place in Paris where Michel Platini, who controls basically five votes on that panel, five out of 22, two blokes have been kicked out. Now it's five out of 20. We're looking good here. Let's get them. So so this is him, Sarkozy, the president invites him over for dinner. Not a, you know, it's probably normally a swingers party, but he goes over there and he says, righto. And oh, hello. Have you met, have you met my friend, the crown prince of Qatar? And have you had, have you met this bloke who's part of this bid that they've got for the World Cup? It's just so weird that you two are both here, right? Now, just to give us an idea of the stakes that are, they're involved when it comes to the World Cup, this has to be put into context. This is, this is, this is what took place at the dinner, according to Tarek. Have a listen to the stakes that are being used for the World Cup. There was a dinner, famous dinner at the Elysee Palace, the home of the French president at the time, Nicolas Sarkozy. The other dinner was the then crown prince and current emir of Qatar, Sheikh Tamim, Michel Platini, another French great footballer, the head of European football, Nicolas Sarkozy. And I believe the French sports minister was there. That dinner had huge implications for the world of football and for the 2022 World Cup. Here is why. Afterwards, Qatar places an order for French jets worth billions of dollars. And Platini has his head turned. Nicolas Sarkozy says, for France, the World Cup, your vote should go to Qatar. And Michel Platini, to his credit, is one of these few voters who at least tells everyone publicly who he voted for in that secret vote. He says he voted for Qatar, though he says he would have done it anyway. Mm, I'm not so sure about that. Right. Okay. okay. So, and this is why it's upsetting. Australia bought French submarines that they didn't even have to build. We didn't get any votes. We welcomed Manu into our hearts. We didn't get any votes. What's going on? I, I guess, I guess my, my question just keep, keeps going back to why. So, you know, Qatar are spending billions on French jets. Uh, they're, you know, the, the bidding process, they co-bid with Russia, didn't they? Russia bid for 2018, Qatar bid for 2022, yeah. and there was a lot going on there. Like, it is a lot of effort. It is a lot of alleged corruption. And then it's, uh, it's a lot of... Oh, no, I don't go with corruption. So that's the other thing. I'm tired of that being said. This is the logical extension of a process that had already been started. So everyone, we, Australia, paid $40 million or $25 million, I can't remember how much it was, of public money to bid for this same World Cup. Let's not forget that. The big issue that England had when they lost to Qatar was that they didn't do the right bribes. <laughs> so that I spoke to a former executive of the Australian bid who told me something incredible. She said they were at Sydney Airport when they had the FIFA Congress here. And one of the big bosses who's in this Netflix documentary, but he's not a bad guy because he's in a T-shirt. So he's cool now. Anyway, so they um, – God's sake. So anyway, <laughs> they're walking past <laughs> – they're at the airport with all of the Aussies, the bid, right? And this bloke walks past. They go, hey, how are you going? And he goes, hey, I just want to tell you, your presentation was amazing. Everybody loved it. And they're like, Really? Thank you so much. And he goes, yeah, it's a shame you can't have it. And they go, sorry, sorry what? <laughs> he goes, well, you know, you've got a Sydney airport's got a, uh, a, a 2 a.m. curfew and the, the FIFA members and the, the big wigs and all of the, uh, uh, obviously, the uh, VI, v, 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 VIPs are on a different time zone, so they won't be able to fly in and out. But, yeah, anyway, well done. And they walk off. And everyone ignores it. And this woman, this uh, Benita is her name, she goes, sorry, did anyone else hear that? And they're like, what? No, that bloke just told us that there's no way we're getting this bid because of the, even though so we should stop spending money. And they all just look at her and they go, what are you talking about? We can, we can still win. And of course, we got one vote. And even then, that was a stretch. So it's very, very important to understand that this is not corruption. It is corruption, but corrupt implies an honest system being corrupted. 
This has never been an honest system being corrupted and it never will be. And that is why I don't, I hate it when people bang on about corruption. Okay. Well, uh, let's say uh, billions of dollars of jets, uh, a lot <laughs> of bribes, <laughs> alleged bribes, and then hundreds of billions of dollars worth of spending on infrastructure. I saw a yeah. post on Instagram today that was equating Qatar to Fire Festival based on uh, some of the accommodation and stuff like that. It, it just, it, it feels like a lot for a a moment where the whole world will be looking at Qatar, many with critical eyes. So, yes. how do you how do you explain the such an effort and such a spend from the Qataris? See, they're playing on levels that you and I don't understand. So, the jets, all of it. A short answer is don't know. Long answer is we'll find out, but it's going to take a while. So we actually don't know why they've we, – we, I can listen to Tim Cahill forever and not hear why they've done it. I can listen to the Emir forever and not hear why they've actually done it. We don't know why they've done it. It's not a Bond film. They don't stroke a cat and tell us, you know, at the, at the one hour, 45-minute mark. We, we, we short answer don't know. We, we know what they're telling us. But well, why would we believe that one? I don't believe anything else that's been said. Mm. So no one knows yet. But here's something I want to throw in the mix. Did you know that Saudi Arabia has a bid in for 2030? It doesn't doesn't surprise me. They just bought an English Premier League football team. Well, they bought Newcastle. And why do the other team? Well, I know we're, we're getting off topic, but why don't the other English teams like the fact that the, the Saudi Arabians have bought in? And now even the Americans, the Liverpool owners, are starting to sell out. Because what do they know that we don't? I'm sure plenty. But, exactly, but, but they also know that these. But they also know that these blokes, and they're all blokes, will not stop until it is they get it, what it is that they think they want, and it's not javelin results. So it's and it's not isn't Qatar a nice place? They could already have that. They've got the airline that sponsors everything under the sun. They've got all of that already. So we're not going to know, and that's why I'm keen for the financial people of the world. That's the pages I need to read because that's what that's where you'll find out. Well, Ed, while we uh, wait and see, I want to turn to some of the other stakeholders involved in the World Cup, in particular the, in particular the companies that are sponsoring the sport, mm-hmm. and then I want to talk to you about what happens on the pitch. But before yes. then, a quick break to hear from our sponsors. All right, Ed. Well, before the break, we spoke about Qatar. Do I get free? Do I get free things from those sponsors? From uh, our sponsors. Hmm. <laughs> we barely get free things from those sponsors. <laughs> <Mate>. <laughs> I'll uh, <laughs> I'll send you I'll send you some Equity Mates merch. That's the best we can do. <laughs> oh, Jesus, this is worse than this for guests. Let's say something, mate. This isn't commercial radio, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. I haven't mentioned Ed Sheeran once. No. So there you go. <laughs> but speaking of our sponsors, it's uh mm. the the World Cup. Uh, well, football in general has some big companies that seem to sponsor everything mm-hmm. and you know like nike and adidas top the list mm-hmm. but there's a number mm-hmm. there's the Maccas of the world the coke of the world mm-hmm. they seem to always throw money at sport and football in particular how have they responded to everything that's going on in qatar and especially you know the recent player revolts great, point. great question here's a here is the point we find ourselves fifa for the first time is facing a future where it's not guaranteed that their revenue increases. 95% of FIFA's revenue comes from the World Cup. In the four-year cycle, it generates 95% of their revenue. They basically live on tuna and beans for three years, and they have to put on all these tournaments they don't want to put on in order to pretend that they care about football so that they can get to this point. So the Russia one in Russia generated four point eight billion dollars. Now I don't know about you, and and I know that that's enough for a one bedroom apartment in Sydney. But I think that's even you know FIFA even finds it hard to live on four point eight billion dollars for four years. Since nineteen fifty, the the revenue has just gone up and up and up. And here is the, one of the great ironies of this: Set Blatter is a huge part of how that happened. He's he was came from marketing, and he got the and that was a he was instrumental in helping them get to this point where they are now. But just released, and this was a, you know, there's little pills in the food. You guys are experts at this, digging through the the information to find the bit that means something. I read this the other day. ITV, shares in ITV fell 
recently, the British broadcaster, you know, the, the large uh, mm. broadcasting entity, on a lukewarm revenue boost from airing the World Cup. That is a phrase no one would ever have thought that they would be uh, that they would be the uttering. This has been a rocket to the moon since the dawn of sponsorship in the World Cup with Coca Cola and Adidas, and so that's why this World Cup is so important to the sponsors. But also, it honestly feels as though they're saying to them, "Just get through this one. Mm. The next one's in America. The next one's in Mexico. The next one's in Canada." And that is where they're trying to get to. This Netflix documentary, I believe, was so that they can put a line under FIFA so that they can come back with the new FIFA, bid on some of the rights to have games for the next one, and they can say, we were part of putting that old awful mob to bed. Look how bad they were. Thank goodness we've got this new crew in charge and they're doing a great job. Oh, by the way, we've actually got some games. That's weird. So that, to me, seems as though... Where that's exactly what's going on here. Now, one in particular, Qatar committed a FIFA rights atrocity, which is much more serious than a human rights atrocity. Two days before the tournament, my homeboy Tarek Panja puts on the internet a video of the official beer sponsor, Budweiser, who pay $112 million to sponsor the World Cup, their tent, their beer tent being moved because it was too visible. For, by Qatari authorities. Yes. That, my friend, is the biggest crime that they have in, in this world. That, that and I know that sounds yeah. ridiculous. No, but yeah. in I... this world, that is the biggest crime that Qatar has committed. That is when Qatar said, you know what? We, are, we still run this joint and we've had your, we have had enough of you telling us what to do. And that is the moment where FIFA goes, okay, great, no problem. Let's get that fuck out of here and never speak of this joint again because that, this is not. And also, then they released the prices, £12 for a beer, mm. £12 for a beer. Yeah. And then they announced they're going to have drunk tanks where if you're, if you're seen to be uh, intoxicated or if they think you're intoxicated, they're going to throw you in these drunk tanks. The only thing is, A, that'll be the funnest place to be for the World Cup. And B, it might be the only way to get any accommodation. You can just have a sleep on the ground. So they're, <laughs> they're going to be the place to be. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if Qatari drunk tanks is going to be my number one preference for places to be. But hey, I might. I'll, I'll let you go and tell me how it is. <laughs> but you see, but you see what I mean. That's the you know that is just the biggest no no. When you when that tent was getting carried, I was like, there it is. That is going to be the image that is going to keep these people up at night so so if the sponsors are just sort of you know i guess not holding their nose but they're just getting through it they see yeah. the united states uh 2026 on the horizon and now fifa are starting to feel that way i mean surely that doesn't bode well for saudi arabia 2030 uh but let's let's put a pin in that let's focus on qatar because we haven't even spoken about what's going to happen on the pitch yet. Yeah, I'm so excited about this. I, I get so that excited. sense. I get that sense. I'm not even going to ask you a question. I'm just going to let you go. What? Well, what happens? <laughs> okay. I have a question for you. Yeah. Who is going to win the World Cup? Well, Brazil are the favourites we yeah. saw. Oh, we could do this for 32 teams, but that is not what I asked. <laughs> Who's going to win the what? World Cup? Yeah. Well, I'm going to say Brazil. No. The answer, my friend, <laughs> the answer, my friend, has to be FIFA. So FIFA has to play two games here. They have to be seen to say thank you very much to Qatar in case they need them again in the future. And they also have to be seen to say, but we will promise we'll never do that again. And Qatar needs an image that they can sell on their Aspire Academy. They've got the quote from Pele. Now they need something to go forever until the end of time so put, let me put it to you this do you honestly think that fifa and qatar want harry kane from england holding up the world cup with his rainbow armband on i i imagine qatar don't that ain't gonna happen <laughs> my friend that is simply not going to happen and here is i'll step you through exactly what's going to happen please do. So, you've got to go to club football quickly paris saint germain is owned by qatar Messi, Mbappe, and Neymar play there. 
Now, I subscribe to be in sports. So I want to know what the official broadcaster in Qatar is trying to sell to me. And it's like there's only three people playing. It's Messi versus Mbappe versus Neymar. That is the only thing that they care about. So Messi standing on the pitch in Paris, holding that World Cup trophy aloft to the adoring PSG slash Qatari fans. As he finishes his last World Cup, he has said it is his last World Cup. He also said last summer he wanted to go back to Barcelona. And then for the weirdest reason, he changed his mind and says he's never been happier than he is at PSG. Neymar put in a transfer request. Neymar said, this project's not going anywhere. This is a joke. Then Neymar went quiet. And now Neymar can't do anything except talk about how much he loves PSG and how much he loves the project. The best one, though, is Mbappe. So Mbappe signs this giant new contract to keep him away from Real Madrid until, oh, that's weird, just after the World Cup. They pay him 90 million euros a year. Then a story comes out that he didn't believe in the coach, he didn't believe in the project, and that he wanted to leave. The whole thing blows up. It blows right up. Do you know what his excuse was? How good is this? That wasn't me who said that. That was my entourage. Now, I love the use of the word entourage, actually, in French. He said, that was my entourage. They did it while I was having a nap. While I was having a nap. So in order for that to be true, while Mbappe is having a nap, his entourage, who like, you know, like the whatever the French version of Turtle and E and Johnny yeah. Drama is, their big plan is to go out and lose 90 million euros a year for their, for their best friend. That's their plan while he's asleep. Mate, sit down and play FIFA, boys, and shut the hell up. So let's, we need to move on quickly, right? Now let's get to what's being said now. This is the key bit. So we've got three countries, France, Brazil, Argentina. We also have to throw into the mix Ronaldo, blowing it up at Manchester United, the symbol of American ownership, the Glazer family, the symbol of uncaring ownership, the Glazers. My theory is that he may well rock up in a PSG uniform. Now, if he rocks up in a PSG uniform and has already agreed to that in some way, then you can put Portugal down for a semi and you can possibly put Portugal down for a Messi versus Ronaldo final. Jeez, that would be big. See? See what you did there? Now you're doing what Qatar wants you to do, thinking big. You're starting to think the way that they want you to think. Go back to what they did when they opened their academy. Who was there? Maradona, Pelé. That is the business that they're in, the so biggest Ed, names of all time. So, Ed, I, I'm almost worried, scared to ask this question, but we have to ask it. There's a key assumption in all of that, which is that the Qataris can control what happens on the pitch. No. there's a, there's a there, uh, FIFA has already told us that they're going to control what's happening on the pitch because they're going to use VAR. And if you say that I'm crazy, did you watch, I forced you to watch New Zealand get knocked out by Costa Rica. Did, did you watch that video? I did watch it. Tough to uh, explain. Well, tough to show on a podcast, but so maybe just quickly explain uh, what we saw. The way that they're going to fix the goals and the way that they're going to make sure that Denmark gets zero goals and Australia gets zero goals is by using this thing called phases of play. So in order for a VR assistant referee, which is how they rule out goals with replays, what they're going to do, and it's what happened to New Zealand in their qualifier against Costa Rica, because the next World Cup is going to America. It's also going, so it's Mexico, North Korea, uh, North, North Korea, Mexico, <laughs> North America, and Canada. But just in revenue on television alone for the Americas is a little bit over a billion dollars, almost one and a half billion dollars. And they couldn't have Australia and New Zealand in the World Cup because SBS just doesn't have that type of money and neither does TVNZ. So I'm afraid it's going to be sheepdog trials for them. However, what they do is a goal goes in, they decide whether or not they want it to be a goal, and if they don't like the goal, they keep rolling the tape back in, quote, phases of play until they find something they don't like and they put that on the screen and they cut out the rest and then that's how they disallow the goal. And, in all, and the second part of it is that the ball, how's this, man? Adidas has been up in this up to their neck since the start, right? Don't even Google them. You think, but you think them working with Kanye is bad? That is the tip of their iceberg. So they have put, they said they put technology in the ball so that the ball can tell when they're offside. The reason that they're doing that is so they don't even have to use footage of players. They can just use avatars that they've built. So when you look at them, the two players 
are an animation. They're not even the actual players. And they can move that animation wherever they want. Sometimes they'll put the two players, the two male players, like crossing each other, which is as close as two men are allowed to get in Qatar. But they get, <laughs> but they won't. But they, and that is how they're going to do it. That is exactly it's how they're going. That's what, it's phases of play, and it's VAR, and that is how they can get any goal they want, and and they can rule out any goal they want. And offside, if they think it's getting too sus with phases of play, they can use offside any way they want. Right. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, look, I've got, a, I do have questions. Surely you could just compare it to the original footage, the the cartoon to the original footage. Which angle? I, I, I don't know. You've obviously thought about See? this more than I have. <laughs> well, I don't right, need to think so... about it because it happened to New Zealand. So I don't yeah. need to think about it because I've seen it happen. They've already started doing it. So once they start doing it, and that's why they use they use these t- little test events and these little bits and pieces. You've got to watch those. You've got to watch the friendlies. You've got to watch the things. And what was the first announcement they made for no reason about VAR three months ago? No reason. For no reason they made an announcement. Uh, no English VAR officials allowed in Qatar. Isn't that the it? funniest? <laughs> isn't that the funniest thing? So the biggest league in the world, where they use VAR probably now more than any other league. For some reason, FIFA comes out and says, the one thing we don't need is your help. Why do that? Why would you need to do that? Yeah, why? You have, you have a basketball World Cup and you go, the one thing we don't want is, is NBA referees because they, 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 they don't know what basketball <laughs> is. So that is, it's not suspicious, it's, it, it's true to form. And that's why. So let's get to the Socceroos. Okay. <laughs> I love the Socceroos. That video that they did about workers' rights, Mm. they are principled human beings. I like these guys and I applaud them. But they may as well not be there. So because (laughs) because of the video, you reckon that now – but I mean, yeah, okay. We We were already on thin ice. Denmark with their protest kits. How funny are Denmark? Oh, we're going to wear a protest kit. FIFA said you're not allowed. Okay, well then we're going to wear it on our training shirt. Oh, pretty big statement, Denmark. Who see who? Who's going to see the Denmark training shirt? Apart from, sorry, no one is the answer there. So they can get lost. Tunisia hasn't said a word. And now this is the bit where you've got to understand when when that when FIFA tells you something, it's about who listens. So FIFA came out just before the tournament and they said. Quote, they said that they, it was time to focus on football and it was no longer, this is not the place for politics and for anything else along that, of that nature. So then you wait. Who was, the first, who was the first group to come out and say, we couldn't agree more? Brazil. They have got the memo. Who was the second group to come out and say, we couldn't agree more? Well, based on your theory about who makes it, I'm going to say Argentina. They don't need to because they got messy. France. Not only did they come out and say, I couldn't agree more, but in the same press conference, their captain, Hugo Lloris, just says as an aside, oh, yeah, and by the way, I don't think the rainbow armband's for me. I just, I'm just not, I just don't think that's for me. You go, brilliant. If your goal is to win the tournament, you gave yourself every chance. Okay, so you're predicting, if I if I can just compile what you think, uh you think France and Tunisia make it out of Australia's group because Australia and Denmark protest? And unless it gets too sus, unless it gets too sus and they let the Danes through and then they get fucking worked in the round of 16. If, every, and- if the other games are really sus, then they might let them have a little go. Okay. But yeah, but for the most part, no, forget it. And then yeah. Brazil and Argentina most likely to meet in a, in a final. They are on the same side of the draw, I think. So no, one of them. No, 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 no. no. The, Argent- the Argies beat Brazil. So that Neymar's done his dash. Okay. It's, it's either Argentina and then on the other side, it's either France or Portugal, depending on what Mbappe's attitude to Qatar is when and he gets there. And what Ronaldo does. And what Ronaldo does. Right. Now, well, do if you people want to know are, the one thing? Do you want I, to know I just, the one thing that could ruin? Oh, yeah, sure. sure. I was just going to say, if people are pulling out their sports bet app and putting on the Ed Cavalier multi, gamble responsibly. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, what's the one thing that, that could change it? Messi signed a deal this year, no, end of last year, to be a tourism ambassador for Saudi Arabia. Okay. So 
the mortal enemy of, of Qatar until yeah. recently. Depends on how they take that. If they take that to be too much of an insult, then Mr. Messi, I'm afraid it's not going to happen this time. But if not, he's home. Okay. A lot of layers to this, Ed. A lot of layers to this. Any, I know uh, that. I know. I know it's annoying, but it is really painfully simple. Ready? Yep. Here's what you're looking for, everybody. Who's talking shit about Qatar? Pack your bags. Who's talking shit about FIFA? You can pack your bags too. Who ain't saying nothing? You're looking good. Mm. Who ain't saying nothing and has a huge global star that looks good holding the trophy in Qatar? You've got a chance. Great. I can't wait for Canada to win the World Cup. <laughs> the other one, if they're really going to we'll get you, I reckon. Then... <laughs> but on my attitude, if you're going to do it, just let Qatar win. I'm like, hey, if you're going to do it, let's do it properly. They get out of the group. That... Qatar get out of the group. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, if Qatar win the World Cup, I will say I 100% believe everything you've just told me. <laughs> I know All right, I well, say... Ed, Ed, we uh, we normally go for fifteen minutes. We've almost gone for forty. I I'll just uh, any other thoughts on the World Cup on Qatar? Any other teams we should be watching, or anything else you think might happen over the next couple of weeks? Uh, their attitude to Africa will be very interesting because part of this whole thing is that they need to say that they're trying to help Africa expand and that they're going to get more teams next time. Their attitude to where Africa ends up is very very interesting. They'll either take a very dim view. Or they'll take the view that, um, no, nah, let's give these guys a little bit of help because that helps them look good. And then, the, and then but the, the last thing I'll say is, and I can't wait for this, is when England get knocked out on some very, very dodgy VAR decisions. That will be the best thing I've ever heard. And then England are currently can – can we play a little game just quickly? Yeah. So I'm a British football reporter. Uh, that spends most of my time complaining about how much football I get paid to watch. And I went to a very good private school. um, And I'd like you to ask me how I feel, and I get paid a lot to go and um, watch football all around the world. Um, And I'd like you to watch, and I'd just like you to ask me how I feel about the tournament. How are you feeling about the tournament? Uh, I'm just, you know, I'm really conflicted because I've spoken to some human rights groups Anyway, got to go. I'm in the first class lounge. I think I've just seen Robaldo, and then I'm getting a taxi to my hotel to go to some free soccer. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so lost. I don't know what point that's proving, but take that, England. <laughs> they're fucking way there, a pack of fucking posh wankers. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ed, on that note, I think we're going to say uh, thank you for joining us on the dive. We look forward to having you back in two weeks when – Messi is holding up the trophy after a questionable VAR decision and you can you have the floor to come and say I told you so. So put that in your uh, calendar. Uh, I look forward to it. Thank you for having me. <laughs> wow, Alec, that was a great interview. But I've got to say, for someone like me who doesn't know a whole lot about football, I'm going to be spending a lot of time on Google following up some of those threads. I've got to ask you, though, any closing thoughts? Um, you've had a couple of days since that interview. Anything else that you want to add that you're thinking about the World Cup? Sasha, you're not alone in terms of Googling. I like to think I know a little bit about football, and I was certainly Googling a lot afterwards. Um, learned a lot. Uh, I think it's probably important to note that we've seen some developments since this interview that in, in some ways reinforce what Ed was saying. So we closed the interview there talking about the companies and the sponsors and Ed mentioned Budweiser as a key sponsor and how the Qataris were moving a tent. Well, since then, one of FIFA's major sponsors is a lot more annoyed because the Qataris have banned alcohol sales at the ground. Uh, I think Budweiser, I think the number is they paid $112 million to sponsor this World Cup. So you'd be pretty annoyed that you can no longer sell your product in the stadium at the game you're sponsoring. Yeah, recoup some of the cost Mm. of that sponsorship deal. They're just going, I mean, yeah, I'd be pretty grumpy too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the other thing we should note is in the interview with Ed, we were speaking about uh, the Australian team and the Denmark team protesting. We have seen protests from other teams. We saw the English football team 
uh, invite migrant workers to their training. And I believe the American football team flew a rainbow flag in support of um, LGBTI rights. And so we are seeing players, I guess, recognize their agency in this situation and, and step up. Um, whether that has any effect in Qatar, we shall see. I would hazard a guess at not, but um, it's good to see the players at least standing up for what they believe in. Yeah, it, really interesting story. I certainly, after having it not on my radar at all, it seems to be everywhere. So obviously stay tuned to The Dive. We've got our headline series. As there's updates over the next two weeks, we will be delivering them to you. Well, let's leave it there for today, Alec. If you enjoyed this episode, then please tell a friend about it. Tell one of your football friends. It really is the best way for our podcast to grow. And if you've just joined us for the first time, then welcome. Welcome. Go check out our back catalogue, lots to explore. Remember, you can follow us on Instagram. We're at The Dive Business News, all one word. You can contact us by email, thedive at equitymates.com and subscribe wherever you're listening right now or watching on YouTube so you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for joining me today, Alec. Thanks, Sasha. Until next time.